to another episode of the Postcast, sponsored by BasketballNews.com. Today on this show, we have two-time NBA champion, NCAA champion with the Kansas Jayhawks, uh, what two-time high school champion in Anchorage, Alaska, FIBA world champion, Mario Chalmers. How you doing, man? Good, man. How you doing? Man, I'm doing good, man. Listen, just reading that off, man. It's it's all about winning, man. You don't want at every level, man. You don't get that a lot. Tell me about it. How, that that has to be a great feeling once you think about it. You know? Uh, yeah, definitely a great feeling. Um, you know, just being able to accomplish all that, been been able to be on some great teams, and not not only being a part of great teams, being able to leave my mark on those great teams. So, um, you know, that's that's the biggest thing for me, and my family, and the whole situation about that is just making making the Chalmers name a, a winning name. Oh, for sure. Most definitely a winner's name with that winning attitude, man. It's, it's, it's in the bloodlines for sure. <laughs> it definitely is. Man, tell us about growing up in, in Anchorage, Alaska. I mean, it's so far from here. We don't know that, you know, basketball or it really exists, but you've been a baller. You got other, you know, NBA players that's, that's from Alaska. But tell me a little bit about growing up in Alaska and also your possible influence in the basketball world while growing up. Um, for me, uh, basketball was different in Alaska just because, you know, everybody's from everywhere. Um, you know, we don't have those homegrown. Well, we do have homegrown athletes, but we was getting a little a little taste from everything, from like West Coast basketball, from East Coast basketball. So everybody's bringing, you know, that different vibe of their basketball background to Alaska. And that's that's what really helped me tone in on, on different skill sets and be able to uh, be able to really work on my game and add different things. It was just being able to work on different things with different people. and. Um, you know, basketball was big when I was growing up, you know, many times Trajan, Trajan Landon would come back and, and work me out just to just to see what I was about, see if I was really ready for the next level. Um, you know, I had a semi relationship with Bulls um, just because he was from Juneau. Uh, it's not really next to Anchorage. So uh, I became closer to him as we got to the NBA. But like you said, there's there's been a couple of athletes from Alaska. So Alaska, I mean, basketball was big in Alaska for, for me growing up. And you said Trajan. So <laughs> how did you... I'm gonna come back, but Trajan, how did let you get to Kansas? And I do. How, how did that happen? He, he dropped the ball, huh? <laughs> nah, he didn't drop the ball. I think honestly, honestly, the thing about it was everybody knew me from growing up. I was a Tar Heel fan. Like my whole family's from North Carolina. Michael Jordan's my favorite player. I always wore baby blue and white. That was my favorite color. So everything about me was Tar Heel Nation. So I think, I think Trajan knew that too. Cause it's funny that uh that you say that because a couple of years, a couple of years later when I was in the NBA, um, Coach K was coming to talk to LeBron. And, um, and I asked Coach K, I was like, why you never recruited me from uh, to come to Duke when you took Trajan and uh, Boozer? He was like, I always knew you was a Tar Heel. So wow. that was the thing. So everybody knew I wanted to be a Tar Heel. And, um, you know, the situation happened with that. And I became a Jayhawk. So, you know, it worked out for the best. So where did your love of the game come from? Um, I think it just came from my family, my pops, really. Um, you know, everybody in my family played basketball from my great-grandma to my great-grandpa to my father, my mom, my sister, my uncles, um, my brother. I mean, my brother, my sister. Um, just everybody, everybody in my family played basketball. So that was a way for me um, to escape every different things I was going on, you know, growing up. And, you know, for me to escape and just fall in love with something and something that could take me, uh, you know, further away. So it does... Does football exist up there? Does baseball, like volleyball, like anything else, like, or is it just, hey, it's, it's, it's pretty basketball up there? You know, actually, I would say, I think the biggest sport in Alaska was hockey at the time. So I think hockey. now that basketball is baseball, <laughs> basketball definitely take a turn. But, you know, football is definitely big up there. Soccer, soccer is big in the summertime. But, you know, I, I wanted to play football, but, I couldn't do that cold weather and get hit in that cold weather. I couldn't do yeah, it. So, so it's, it's actually cold as hell up there then. Well, uh, not cold, cold as hell, but cold, 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 cold. <laughs> It's freezing out there. So I, that was just something I couldn't do. I had to find me an indoor sport. <laughs> so in high school, you win a state champion uh, championship two years in a row, and you're also player of the year three times in a row. What was the competition like, and how, how was that respect given to you you know, year in, year out that you were player of the year and then also able to carry your team to two state championships? 
Um, I think the biggest thing for me was I, I got better each and every year. Um, you know, coming in, coming into my freshman year, ninth grade, I didn't play eighth grade year because that's when they took a middle school basketball out. So all I did for my entire eighth grade was getting the gym and work out. So that's all I did to be ready for that next season coming with the coming with the high school. So, I mean, my first game in high school, I think I had eight, 18 and four or something like that. So it, once I started getting on the floor, getting comfortable and finding my, my niche and understanding the game of basketball for real at that level, then, I mean, I was able to just keep getting better each and every year. And I had people around me that made sure I was getting better, made sure that, you know, I was focused on basketball. So I would really say, you know, competition was good. I'm not going to say the competition was bad, but I just think my hard work and my ethic was the ones that kind of put me up there and put me, sent me um, above the rest. Y'all hear that, fellas? And it's true. Hard work and dedication. It gets you somewhere. It gives you at least a chance. Get your foot in the door. Get your foot in the door. And, and that's from a man up in Anchorage, Alaska, <laughs> trying to figure out, you know what I'm saying, his next move. But you all don't have hard work. There. So, you know, we, are, we always, I mean, from my, I would say from when season ended in March, my junior year, I was flying out to, California and Vegas every weekend to go play a tournament just to be seen. So, mm -hmm. I mean, as far as much as work I had to put in and everything I was doing, I was still flying out to go other places to be seen. Nobody was coming to Alaska to see me. So, you know, that was the, that's one thing about Alaska is like college coaches don't really come up there. Wow. Having a successful high school career, when did you think actually college was a possibility for you? Like you said, you would fly to the West Coast Cali and play in Vegas to play in different tournaments. But when did you actually know that, you know what, college is, is, is a good chance for me to, to further my basketball and education at the next level, which would have been college? Um, when I got my first letter, I would say I went to a camp in North Carolina um, and I got my first letter from Richmond College. And I think that was my eighth grade year going into my ninth grade. Wow. I think it was the summer. So that's when it clicked on me, like, okay, I can really do something with basketball. I'm already starting to get letters. So, and this is for me being in the lower 48, where, you know, the competition out there is anything, you know, you know who you're going to run into. So that's, right. that was the thing that, you know, gave me that drive and made me even hungrier to, to want to be better at basketball, to be able to see what I can do, get to college. Cause I definitely didn't want to go to UAA in Alaska. Didn't want to <laughs> Alaska. So that was my thing, just figuring out a way to get out. You want to take your talents elsewhere, huh? Bring it <laughs> How to go see the world, see something different. Right. So during this, your senior year, you, you graduate. And like you said, you're going through the summer AAU stuff. What was the reason of you going to Kansas? What was the other schools involved? And how did you come up with your final decision to go to Kansas? Um, uh, that's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> I had pretty much every school in America want me to go to. I mean, I was number one point guard in the nation at the time. So for me at that time, my top schools was um, Georgia Tech. I liked Wake Forest at the time, but Wake Forest was too small as, as, a, as a place. I didn't want to go there. Um, Kansas, North Carolina, Arizona. Those are my, my mm -hmm. final decisions. And I took a visit to Arizona. Um, you know, my host was uh, Mustafa Shakur and Andre Iguodala. And the, oh. thing about that, <laughs> the thing about that, which I mean, me, me and Iguodala still joke to this day. He's like, Riyadh, I still don't like you because you didn't come to Arizona. But the thing <laughs> me was I'm, I'm, a, I'm coming into college, so I want to see what college is like. You know, I don't want to – I know Iggy's on his way out of college getting ready for the draft, so he's, he's more on some grown man. Let me get my rest and make sure I can get up and work out. I'm trying to hang out see what college is, but I got to come here next year. Right. So that was with Arizona, it was like – I, with Iggy and them, they showed me like the more professional side of like doing your work, being on time and trying to get to the next level and getting out. When I went to Kansas, Kansas was like a party. Like, oh, this is what I was looking for. Like, oh, this, this, is, this is what I seen on He Got Game. Right. <laughs> right. So that's when, that's what I was like, okay, Kansas, this is it. This is why I want to go to Kansas. Like, I feel like I'm at home. Everybody's welcome me. Like, that the chills that you get, like uh, and you always hear everybody say this, but the chills that you really get when you walk into that field house mm -hmm. is a feeling like like no other. So when I went to my first game and I got chills, I was like, ah, oh, this nothing's better than this. Like this right. atmosphere, this this history 
I already had been liking Coach Self since uh, since he was at Illinois, so I was already a Coach Self fan. So that was one of my coaches that I was looking at to play for. Okay. And so when it happened, it just it overwhelmed me. It took me, and I was just like, boom, I want to come to Kansas. I'm like, I, I don't want to do anything else. And that's when I had made my, my final decision. But like I told you from the beginning, I always wanted to go to North Carolina. And the thing about mm -hmm. that, we played a tournament. Um, we played a tournament in Vegas, and I had seen Roy Williams at that game. I had talked to him. And that game, the player I was playing against, I don't want to put names out there, but I, I killed that player. So I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking, boom, I'm going to North Carolina. This is my junior year. I'm like, boom, I'm going to North Carolina. This is, I just I put on the show in front of Roy Williams. Like, I'm going home. Right. Um, everybody going to see me play. Right. So I talk to him. He tells me the only way I can come to North Carolina is what Raymond Felton go pro. So mm. there was rumors that he was going that he was going pro. So I just had to wait for him to announce it before they could officially offer. Right. I got home. I had that conversation. Two days later, they offered a player that had just played a scholarship. When they oh, told me, wow. so boom, right there, I'm like, oh, you lied to me. Right, so right. From moment on, I was off Four Rims. I was off North Carolina. I y'all was the enemy now. I don't want nothing to do with y'all. So that's when I was even, that's when I started looking for other places. And that's where Kansas, Arizona and everything else came out. And then after that visit to Kansas, I was like, this is it. There's no better place than here to play my college basketball. Right. I mean, you have, you know, legends. Will Chamberlain, you got Paul Pierce from there. I mean, Ray from France there. I mean, you got, you got some names that, that's come Amen. through that university and it's top dog. You know what I'm saying? It, it ain't no right. slouch there. So you on TV, you on TV every time. So. That was the biggest thing, just trying to be seen and, and trying to further my time so I can really get to the next level where I really want to be. Right, right. So you spend three years there. Let's talk about your, your junior year, that incredible NCAA run you had, that incredible shot you had against the Memphis Tigers to send right, it, right. one, to send it into, o, uh, into OT and then to put the nail in the coffin. How was that, how was that run? You know, everybody don't understand March Madness, but just the whole feel in that run to get up to the, the national championship game and then have major big shots, big plays to win it all. You know, everybody don't, don't get that experience. Only only you, Rio, only you. <laughs> um, I mean, before before anything in my junior year, I got to take it back to my last game of my sophomore year. And this is what really changed me as a player, as a person, as a, as a man, really. It was like, we play UCLA in the uh, Elite Eight to go to the Final Four. To this day, I would say that's the worst game I've ever played. Like, they put Josh Ship on me, who was 6'5", 6'6". You know, I'm a scrawny 6'2". I'm not taking a weight room serious when I first get to college. Like, I'm playing around. You know you know how we do something. Right. You know, we still kids at that moment. So, that game. One for seven, seven turnovers. I feel miserable. I feel like I let the whole team down. Because in my mind, I'm, I'm thinking like, okay, this is my chance to go go pro. If we beat USA, so I'm I'm looking ahead, I'm not right. focusing on the game. So worst game of my worst game of my life. I feel like I let the team down. Everything. So that summer, my whole focus is get strong, get stronger, work on work on get my release quicker, being able to take bumps. So. That summer, I got in the gym with Coach Dooley and Coach Manning, and they really, like, they put me through some workouts. And so for that that whole season, um, like, even I was just watching my highlight tape from Kansas my junior year the other day, and if you just look at me, I'm able to take different bumps and bruises through that whole season that I couldn't take my sophomore year. Mm -hmm. when, we come, when we come to that moment of going to the tournament, you know, that's time to lock in. Like, boom, we got four seniors on, this, on the team. This is their last – well, five seniors, this is their last time three seniors start. So it's like, this is all our last chance to really leave it on the line, especially after last year. So my whole focus that was, you know, just being solid, being able to do what I could do. And once we get to that moment, try to take over. And that shot versus Memphis, we've been running that play every day in practice since I got to campus my freshman year. So that <laughs> play is just, it's natural to me. Like I've been working on it so much that it's easy. It's easy. So, right. When it comes to that moment, like the team knows, the coaching staff knows, get Mario the ball, he's going to finish. He's gonna finish. <laughs> I've proven it before. I hit a shot versus Texas the year before in the Big 12 tournament to send the same game in the overtime. Wow. So when it comes to this time, 
it's a little, everybody knows what's going on, but it's a little hesitation because Sharon kind of fall, falls, fumbles the ball and falls. So they don't know if he's really going to get it to me. All I tell Sharon, you give me the ball, it's going in. That's right. Like, no matter what. So me, me and somebody else was talking about this the other day. I get the ball, I'm able to take one dribble, and they asked me, they was like, how was you able to see the rim? Mm. And I said, just from being in the weight room, I was able to really stop on the dime. And like, you really go back and watch the shot, you see Dozier and Derrick Rose slowly go like this, and I'm straight like this. Mm. Wow. I put that to the weight room because I was able to keep my balance off my weak left leg and just be able to stop on the dime and not not fade. If I fade, right. they're going to block me. Or it's right. going to be off my tip. So just with that shot, I just, it was just being able to stop on the dime in that moment and let them go by and just focus and really get to my spot. Not, not let the moment overwhelm me. Right, you was ready for the moment. Like you mentioned, yeah, y'all played against the Memphis Tigers and D. Rose, he was a guard on there, young guard. You know, and he was getting a lot of hype, you know, well deserved and everything. And Calipari was the coach of the team, and so their whole they had that whole buzz, you know, pretty much all all season long. So on that stage right there, what was that battle? Was it was it something like, oh, you know, I really got destroyed, D Rose, you know, what I'm saying, or Calipari this or some? What was that? You got to be a little extra juice to that, especially on the biggest stage. Um, it's extra juice, but this is this is the thing that really really stuck in my mind with, with that game is, you know, Coach Manning told us, no matter what y'all do, he's going to be the number one pick, the number one or two pick. Mm. So don't focus on trying to stop the number one, two pick. Focus on stopping wow. the number one pickers. Wow. And, like, you can only say that when you've been in the NBA, you've been in different things like that, you've been through different situations. So, like, Coach Manning was a lot to us. Like, he meant a lot to us just because he's been in the situation where we were trying to oh, and you said Coach Manny, that's Danny Manny. Yeah, I forgot. Yeah. I forget him, Danny Manny. Yeah, yeah. So, so once you hear that, it's like, okay, boom. Like we're not even worried about that. We win this game. Everything else will take care of itself. Not like last year. Like we, like last year, we thinking about everything else before this game. So just being able to lock in in that moment, like I just knew, like I just knew we had to win that game. Like it's just. Once we got into overtime, I knew we took all the took all the, the heart from them, all the energy, and it was just it was gonna be easy for us after that moment. So now you hit the shot, the cinema OT, you hit the shot to win the game. So at that moment, did you already know you was gone? You was coming out, you was coming to the league, you was gonna put your name in? <laughs> I knew I was gonna put my name in. I didn't know if I was gonna stay or not. Because uh just the biggest thing with me, the biggest knock on me for coming out was I didn't play the point guard in college. Like, even though I was the number one point guard coming out of high school, I moved to the two in college just because we needed more scoring. And that that really helped my game out, just making me into a more of a scorer, more of a spot shooter, working on my shot. So I knew I knew that I wanted to go. I just knew I had to prove myself. So going through all those, those workouts with the draft teams, I felt like I had proved myself enough to stay in the draft. So when it came to making that decision, talking to my family, talking to Coach Shell, um, Coach Shelf didn't want me to go. I know that for a fact, but you know, he, <laughs> right? You know what I'm saying? He got he let he, he wants y'all to run it back. Probably come back. Y'all can run it back. Yeah, for sure. He, that's what he wanted, but um, the situation was a little different. So I just felt like it was my time. Um, it was your time. You know, I ended up running it back, but wow, you did it. Hey, you won. Yeah. Hey, you won it. Now you can get up out of there, right? <laughs> hey, I got. I got to see what's next. You know? Right, right. So 2008, you drafted 30, the 34th pick. Now, you know, the 34th pick, you're just coming off a great, you know, college career, winning it all, biggest stage ever. And now you go to 34th pick. How did that make you feel? And what did you think about some of the other players where you thought you should have went? Go ahead. Um, it's all good. Hey, it's hey, all good. Honest, honest opinion, I was hurt. Like, if you go look at that, my video, my draft video, I was hurt. Just because I felt like I was so much better than – a lot of those players that was picked ahead of me, like, like for instance, I was chasing Russell Westbrook. Like, just because I felt like then, this is then, fresh out of college, Russell Westbrook, I feel like I, I could I could match up with him. Like, it'd be, I could handle that. And right. I knew he was a high buzz. So I was, I was chasing him, um, never got a matchup with him. So um, 
that 34th pick hurt because I, I had been told by a couple of teams that they was going to take me higher er, earlier. But, you know, everything happens for a reason. So me and taking 34th to Minnesota, I was a little shocked because I never – I did work out for Minnesota. And they had just took um, – I want to say they had took OJ Melio and Kendall Love before they traded OJ or something like that. And I was like, wow, like that's two guards. Like what, what's it going to be in there for me? So on that day, as I'm walking to the back, I was shaking Adam Silver's hand. Some guy yells, hey, Mark, you know you got traded, right? And I'm in my own world. Like, stop playing. Like, I'm trying right, to enjoy it. Right, right, right. Like, you know, we're being, over, being upset, but just trying to enjoy the moment. He's like, nah, for real, you got traded to Miami. So now I'm like, are you really playing with me? Like, who are you? He <laughs> tells me who he is. I turn around, and the other official from the draft is like, I need your hat here for the Miami Heat hat. Wow. Everything changed for me. I'm like, I'm going where? Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Oh, and the thing about me, I'm the biggest D-Way fan. Now, like, that was one of my favorite players growing up, and – like in 2003, everybody knows about the Great Alaska Shootout that used to be in Alaska, where everybody used to come. Like Carolina came, Ohio State, a couple of teams came. So in 2003, D Wade and Marquette came, and that's when I had one. I had won my first Alaska Player of the Year before that. So they had brought me to the back room. I had met all the big names that was there, and I had told D Wade, I said, "You go to the NBA, I'm gonna meet you in the NBA." Mm. I had told him wow. that. And, to this day, he would still tell you, like, I remember I remember Rio telling me that. Wow. And, like, you'd be drafted and be on the same team and had that come to fruition like that. It was like, okay, like, yeah, this happened for a reason. Right, right. So did, yeah. did you – so for your workout, the teams that you work out for, did you work out for the Heat? No. Nope. I didn't work out for the Heat. I didn't work out for Minnesota. I worked wow. out for 15 other teams, 14 other teams, though. Wow. So you get down to Miami, D Wade, like you said, you told him you're gonna meet him there. Mm -hmm. It was like I told you so. It was more okay. so like I told you. So. But, but the funny thing, the funny thing about that is, this is before me and Bees became friends. Okay. You know, me, me and Bees kind of didn't like each other all the way from. You know, I'm older than Bees, so I would say ABCD camp at Adidas because mm. he was he was a big name. I was a big name. He was cocky. I was cocky. Like. You know what I'm saying? That's how we was. And then put it on top. He go to K-State. I go to KU. Right. I was about to ask him. Yeah. He talking all that about the first game and they beat us. <laughs> we come to second game. We killed him, but he still has 44. So it's kind of <laughs> like it's basketball bad blood between us. So it's right. kind of like on draft day. I remember on draft after I got drafted, he's already, you know, everybody goes to the club. I see him. So I walk up. I still got my heat at it. He got his heat out. I'm like, I'm like, yo, bees, what's up? He's like, yo, you got driving to the heat too? He said, oh, it's on. <laughs> and then from that day on, me and Bees became inseparable. And that was, that was a big help for me just because I had a young player with me, you know, I had to go through the same thing I had to go through. It was a learning process for both of us. And then we had D Wade and all the other vets like Sean Marion and Jermaine O'Neal like guiding us. So it was, it was, it was real fun rookie year for me. I will say that. So, I mean, we know, you know, being down in Miami, you know, the nightlife, the city life, it changes a lot, you know. It could be overwhelming for some. But yes, also, we, we also know about the heat culture in itself. Yes. Tell me from your point of view, how was, what is the, what does the heat culture mean to you? And how did you survive the Miami heat life and be, uh, and play at the end of the day? Heat culture is, you better be bringing hard hat every time you touch that court. And if not, don't even show up. So that was the thing. That was the thing about me. And the, the thing about me, I've always been a hard worker. Like, no matter what, I'll, I'll go out, have fun, but I'll be back in the gym the next day. I'm not going to say the morning because I'm not a morning person. But at some time of that day, I'm in the gym for two hours. Right. So just for me being able to do that and then having that same background already coming to the heat culture, it, it kind of helped me. I mean, it kind of it kind of worked in my favor where I was able to fit in perfectly able to do different things and still, you know, be able to be su successful, you know, being able to start all 82 games as a rookie, you know, my first year. So, um, yeah, I was able to fit in. The D-Wade had my back. Um, you know, Coach Bo was a first-year coach, so it was a learning process for both of us. So I had to learn him, he had to learn me. So it was just a big learning process, but, you know, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I think you hit it on the head when you say, you know, you got to bring your hard hat every day. Like, it ain't no slacking, you're going to work. 
And Hard you, better be on, you better be on the same page because as soon as you try to flip the page and flip the script, you no, I tried that. A, yeah, I tried that a couple times. I went out of there, but I was hey, <laughs> it was close. It was close. <laughs> Just watch out, man. So, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, because you know, you say Spo, you know, first year coach or whatever, but Pat Riles, Pat Riley. Yeah. Yeah, you know, he, hey, he got his hands on everything. He know everything. He looking down and he's sitting there like this. I knew, I knew, Pat, Riley was a troop. I knew Pat Riley was a troop, but he had told me, he's like, oh, you went to the club last night. Like, <laughs> he told me how many drinks I had at the club yeah. and what time I left the club. I was like, oh, yeah. I'm, oh I'm cool. Like, I, you know all that. <laughs> I don't, don't want to go out no more. Like, I had to find different ways to do different things. I'm like, no, I'm not messing with Pat. Listen, All right, sure. if, if you played there, I'm, I'm sure you experienced it. Like I said, when, when I was down there, listen, he knew what time, like you said, what time we got in, what car we drove, what everything. Like you said, where we drank and everything, too, who he was with. Like, I, I promise you, it was like the people at the clubs was on payroll or something because he was not to I a still team. Think that. I still think that. <laughs> Some of them clubs were on payroll. I still think that. Oh, man. That's crazy, but yeah, that's that's the kind of like Pat Rouse, man. Shout out to Rouse, man. He he got yeah. that right down there. Yeah, and like you said, you you have to respect the culture. You know what I'm saying? And that's yeah. when he got there, you could tell the change, and everybody buys into it. And that's just it's just the heat way at the end of the day. It's, that's what I that's what I really respect most is like they don't conform to any player. Like this is this is the heat way. It's been like this for 25, 30 years, and you're not coming to change. And that's why I like the heat culture so much. Like I think it's one of the best in the business. You're right, exactly. And what you say, you know, he's not gonna give it to any player, right? So in 2010, right. LeBron James comes, the king, the king comes. Yeah, we so, did. <laughs> so hey, he comes there, you know, he takes his talents to South Beach. He comes there and he wants a, a, a number six jersey, a number six number. But somebody is already wearing number six. But somehow, some way, the Kane, the Brian James gets number six. Could you you know anything about that? I know the real story. I know oh, what's the real story. That's, that's what I'm saying. I know the, the real story. <laughs> the real story is this. When I first got to Miami, Mark Blunt was wearing number 15. So Mark Blunt last year was my second year, was by, yeah. 2009, 2010 was his last year with the Heat. Brown's coming 2010, 2011. He said, I already put my change in, because you know you got to put your change in for the right. to change the number. So I had told him, Mark said he wasn't coming back. Like, Mark Mark was going through some things. He was, wasn't there. So I had told him, like, yo, I want 15 back next year. So I was already going to number 15 before it was even talked about Brown coming to my end. So uh, Brian, Brian still gave me something for the number. Like he still took. I was about to ask you, what, hey, what did yeah. that six go for? What did go, you could tell us how much he 20, 30, what would it go for? Nice, nice little, nice little duffel bag, you know, oh, a little pocket chain. Nice little, nice little okay, okay. So, yeah, I mean, he took care of me. So it wasn't like it wasn't like he took the number. I was already changing the 15, but he, it's Pat Riley. He was getting six regardless of now. Let's keep it. <laughs> so I'm not gonna sit here like no, he wasn't getting six. No, no, he was gonna get six right regardless. So I don't know. I, 15 was open, so I was going to 15. So I just made it easy. <laughs> so there y'all have it. The the real story of how Mario ended from six and goes back to 15. <laughs> College. College so, as as Brian entered that, that 2010 season. And you already have, you know, a lifer in Dwayne Wade there as well. You also had Chris Bosch. What were those practices like? And where did you see you fitting in? Because, I mean, Norm Brown and D-Wade, you know, they're ball dominant. And so it sort of takes you out of your position, which is, which is a point guard. You know, when I was there, we sort of had, we didn't have, we had Dwayne Wade. And then we had Jay Will, White, White Chocolate at the right. point. But sometimes the point guard, Wasn't able able to be the point guard. How did you adjust and figure your way out to make it to make it work? Um, For me, it just took me back to my college days, and that's why that's why Coach Shelf put me at the two in college. Really helped me with that situation because you know it put me back in the catch and shoot. Like I was still still bringing the ball up the court sometimes to get it to them in the spots they like to get to, and then the next thing I'd just be ready to shoot. 
And then sometimes they'll throw a little pick and roll with me, which is what I'm best at. And with CB or Brian setting a pick, you know, I have the best of both worlds for both of them. And just being able to make different decisions and show them that, you know, they can trust in me, they can rely on me. I think that was the biggest thing that really helped our team. Because, you know, when Brian first came that first season, I had I had uh, popped four ligaments in my ankle that summer, that summer he came. So I didn't work out with the team. I wasn't able to really be active until November, December. So I wasn't feeling like myself at all that season until the Dallas series, pretty much. And that's when, that's when I kind of had to change. When everybody was like, "Oh, like Rio can really play. Like he he can really help us and show us some stuff." And it was like, "Yeah, I'm healthy. Like this is what I do. You put people around me. What I can do is pick a roll and, and pick people apart. That's that's what I'm best at." So that's when. That's why I just be able to get comfortable. Then that next season, I was started. I was starting again. So we were just able to take off and build camaraderie from there. Because you know, me and D Wade already had it from being me being in the two previous years before that. And then I getting the ball. Me and Bron, me and Bron clicked like we knew each other since we was kids. And you know, that happened off the court. So when it translated to on the court, it made it even easier. And then you know, CB is the quiet one. You know, CB just he wanted to do the dirty work and get get the job done. So that just made it easy that he wasn't as dominant, as demanding, I should say, as D Wade and Brown was for the ball. So it, it made the situation for me easier. All right. So do you remember? It was it a game, a practice, maybe a conversation that you remember where you know you had gained their respect, or you know, just that whole. Yeah, respect from the from the big three. Cause like I said, they they on every headline. So you forget you forget about everybody else. You would think it was just those three versus everybody else. But you know what I'm saying? Uh -oh. For for you, was it a, a conversation or a game that you that you felt like the respect was actually given, just like earned that way? And i yeah, it should, it should be the big yeah, three plus okay. three or something like that. <laughs> it, it's funny because it all happened like one on one. Like before Brian, I mean, before Brian and CB got there, me and D-Wade got into it in Utah. He was trying to tell me something about getting to the corner, and I was, I, he thought I was being smart. I promise. I still, to this day, don't think I was. But <laughs> me and him got into it. And then me, I don't back down from anybody. I don't care if you're 7 12. I, I'm not backing down from him. So from me knocking back it down to D-Wade and actually standing up to him, I think that right there gave me his trust in the beginning. As soon as I got there. So that trust was already developed. That relationship was already developed. Then the situation when me and Brian got into it uh, in the Pacers game, that kind of even boosted the trust even more because like you hearing it from D-Wade that D-Wade said he trusts me. Now me and you get into it and I'm not backing down from you. Mm -hmm. So therefore that gives you more trust to know that any situation we're going through, I'm going to be right there with you no matter what. Right. And then me and CB got into it in the Chicago game. So just getting into it with all three of them and not backing down. And then no matter what you say to each other, I'm I'm still going, I'm still, we still gonna be friends. Like as long right. as you don't probably want to be real disrespectful, we're gonna get through it. We still gonna be friends, we teammates, we're a brotherhood. Right. So right. just by me being like that and not backing down, not not holding grudges, not doing any of that, just still showing up the next day to work. Being on time, being 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 able to be able to count on me, like you know, I'm not slacking. So, just being able to earn the trust one on one, I think that really made it all come together in in the end. So now you're on another bigger stage, the NBA Finals. You know, everybody want to win an NBA title, but you're on the bigger stage again. You know, you're playing against OKC. You had the young KD, Westbrook again. You know, Westbrook, and then you also had James Harden. Tell us a little bit about that series and, and how y'all was able to, you know, withstand their, that young talent to win the Miami Heat's second, you know, championship. Um, that was really our first one. Uh, oh, Miami Heat's second one, but our first one together. I think, I think the biggest thing with that one was just the experience that we went through with the Dallas series the year before that, losing to them, uh, how we lost to them. So everybody, I think everybody took each game Seriously, I'm not saying that it wasn't serious, but nothing, nobody took no possessions for granted. And I think just being able to outwork them, outsmart a young team like that and, and outgrind them, I think that's what really helped us to beat them. So do you so did you still take a little personal about the about the Westbrook? Um a little bit, but I knew my matchup was James Hart. So I know my main mm -hmm. focus was 
trying to shut him down and not let him have a, a big series. And I think I did I think I did an okay job of shutting him down for that series. So, I mean, not shutting it down, but just making it difficult for him. So, um, yeah, that was that was my that was my job. I wasn't really worried about Westbrook. Westbrook proved himself already. I mean, he right. he's a special talent. Like I haven't seen nobody with that type of energy and desire and fire to play this game <laughs> right in a long time. So like. Like I said, I was chasing Westbrook that 2008. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, that stopped. That stopped after that. So you you win your your first NBA champion with the Heat. Like I said, a, along with the Big Three, what was that experience like winning that actual NBA championships? Now you go back to uh, your college, you know, NCAA championship, and then the high school. What was it? I mean, the emotions that go through it. Do you just really sit back and? And think about like, man, I just, I just keep sort of winning, man. Like, I just keep. I'm. A, it gotta be me. It gotta be me. You know what I'm saying? But what was that? I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie. It never. It never really hit me until people brought it up. Like, mm. so you went on every level, and then I'd be like, "Damn, yeah, I did win on every level, huh?" Yeah. Like, so I don't. I don't be thinking like that. I'd be in the moment like, "Oh, I just won an NBA championship." Like, nothing really matters right now. Like. I've been waiting for this moment since I was four years old. I just seen Jordan hold up trophies, Akeem Olajuwon hold up right. trophies, right? All them hold up trophies. Like I want to hold up the trophy too. So that was that was like that. And then after doing that, then starting to hear about like you, you went on every level. You up there with Magic Johnson. You up there with uh, other names. You like hmm, Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson's like, yeah, dang, that's something like. They can't take it away. They can't take it away. You, you can't take that. No matter what, you, whatever you say about me, say I didn't win and I did not leave my mark for every team I played for. Right. That, that's something that a lot of people can't say. Right. Yeah. That's shit. That's big right there. So now you win your second. You know, you, your second ring with the Heat against the Spurs. How was that feeling playing against the Spurs, which was a dominant force in the West? You know, they're just so you say robotic, but they have players. That they turn into bigger mega stars for the most part, but you're on the biggest stage again uh, for your second, you know, NBA title. Uh, having that experience of the first one was the second one a little difficult. Well, a little, a lot more difficult. I say, <laughs> still to this day, I will say, Game Six versus Spurs is probably the hardest game I've ever played in my basketball career mm. to to this day. Right. And just like just I could I could play like that whole fourth quarter from. Me coming to the paint, my turnover to try to hit D Wade instead of laying it up to Tony Parker going down. Like I remember everything about that that last part of that game. So still to this day, that game six was the hardest game I played. But like you said, winning that second one, that was kind of like, like I made it. Like, I'm, <laughs> right. I can't say nothing about me. Right. Um, games versus Spurs, three good games versus Spurs. So I'm, like I'm feeling happy. real good. You yeah. should. I'm feeling, I'm feeling back like like I was a reason that we won. I mean, right. one of the reasons in college. Like I hit the shot to do that. I had three big games, right. three game series versus a great one of the greatest teams has ever been put together. Right. Like people don't understand. Like to actually on the biggest stage be able to contribute right. and play and have an impact on those games and then win. Like yeah, y'all mean. You know, your head up high, your chest out a little bit. Like, yeah, I, I want this, you know. Like, unfortunate situation, some guys can't play, but you actually affected the outcome of the game on the biggest stage to win it all. Like, it's different. <laughs> chest like this, like, what's up? Yeah, like, <laughs> you feel yourself. <laughs> like, hey. Like, hey, I remember one game versus first. I had 20 points in the first half. Didn't score the second half. But, hey, I still had 20. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm still, I still did my thing. I don't know. I don't know what y'all talking about. But, hey. Right. It just means like that, yeah, like. Like, man, I was really on the biggest stage and I really left my mark. Like, okay, the OKC game, game four, the 25 points. Like, that's great. Like, I, I love that and all that. But it wasn't consistent for me. And that's the thing that a lot of people talk about it, but in my mind, it wasn't a consistent thing. Versus Spurs, out of seven games, I had three and a half, maybe four good games of scoring-wise, I should say. And that's, that's to me, is, is helping leave your mark, helping – do what you could do to help the team win. And I I just feel like I left my mark more on the second championship than I did in the first championship, even though I had the game four that everybody talked about. So all this basketball experience, what is it about these 
these moments of these big shots and, and just big plays? Like, is it is it a player that you looked up and saw him in those situations and like, yo, man, it, that has to be a great feeling because everybody can't and don't have that right ability um, to you know make those plays, let alone a shot. What what is where do you get that from? You think? Um, two people. I say first Michael Jordan, of course, that was my favorite player, but. The second, person, the second person, I don't even think he knows this, but I would say my pops. Um, like he was the one that really, when the grind got tough in games, he put the ball in my hands and be like, go win the game. And no matter if I win the game or not, like starting from a young age, like six years old, like YMCA, Boys and Girls Club, here, go, go make the play. And just even from then, like even if I was successful or not, it was always good. You did good. Like you tried, you did good. You didn't back down from the situation. And to be to be able to be confident in those moments, you can never have doubt. Mm-hmm, and that, right. that was the thing, like my dad taught me in those type of situations, like leave it all out there. Like it's 50-50. <laughs> it's right. 50 So it's either you're gonna believe this 50 or you're gonna doubt this 50. And right. for me, I've always been a believer. So it's kind of like uh, when that moment comes, I, yeah, I want the ball. Don't right. even ask. Give me the ball, like give me the ball. Right. Whatever, whatever's going on, just make sure I have the ball and I'm taking that shot. And that's give him the ball and move out the way. Yeah, like I've had that mentality since, since I was a kid. So I think that just being in different situations and like the more successful you get in those, I mean, yeah, the more successful you get in those situations, the more you want to be in them. And for right. me, being able to keep being successful makes me want to keep keep being in them situations. Like even still to this to this day, like. We played a game the other day. I want to take the last shot. Like in the quarters, I'm taking the last shot. Like don't don't look to nobody else. Just right. Last shot. Like, <laughs> I need that. It's like it's a, right. <laughs> yeah. Like it's 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 a feeling. Like I feel like if I don't take that last shot, I'm letting everybody down. I'm letting myself down. Mm. Like, I just have to do that. Because you prepare yourself, you put your time in, and, and I mean, not that you don't trust your other teammates, but you just trust yourself more <laughs> at that time. <laughs> I definitely trust myself more. And the thing about it, what makes it even easier is they trust me more. Like, yeah, yeah we want to. Like, yeah. Like, we're not hating. Give him the ball. And it's like, oh, okay, yeah. Right. <laughs> so, now, now you won at the, the FIBA level, two mm-hmm. NBA championships, NCAA championships, and two uh, championship and two high school championship, which game gave you the biggest chills and what games do you watch to this day as you just, you just always pop it in and you just watch it again, just to relive the moment. Uh, Definitely game six versus Spurs. Game six and seven versus Spurs. Um, Game four and five versus OKC. Uh, the 10 threes versus Sacramento. 10 threes versus Sac? Right. Okay. And then still to this day, I watched the fourth quarter of the Portland game that we played before the Sacramento game. And this mm. is the thing. This is the thing about that Sacramento game. That game before then, I don't know if I was in foul trouble or what happened. But Spo sat me for the whole fourth quarter and put me in to take the final shot. Wow. Wow. So, yeah, I've been sitting, you know how long an uh, NBA fourth quarter, especially. Right. <laughs> Pose, man, Pose, I've been sitting there like, man, I'm itching to get in. Like, come on, come on, come on. He puts me in. Three seconds left. Mm. Wide open look. Wide open. I'll tell you, we're wide open the next person. <laughs> Most of person to be in the stands. Right. <laughs> Brick. I was like, oh. Oh, hell no. Nah. Wow. So I'm sitting, I'm sitting on that. Like, you know, I got the tattoo, Mr. Clutch on my arm. I'm talking about I'm like, man, I'm about to take this clutch tattoo off my arm. I don't even want it no more. <laughs> so Brown, like, hey man, don't mm. worry about it. It's all good. Don't worry about it. D-way, like, don't worry about it. You D, don't worry about it. Man, hell no. I just missed this shot. Like, I'm known for being clutch. Like, I can't do that. He's like, don't worry about it. The next game, warming up. I'm like, man, like, something's in the air tonight. Like, (laughs) I tell them that. I'm like, yo, something's in the air tonight. (laughs) I hit that first one. 
Hit the second one. Hit the third one. Four, fifth, six, seven. I'm like, oh, okay, it's about to be one of them games. So I'm lights out, 10 for 13. Right, temperature <laughs> check. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's my thing, like, okay, I missed this shot, but I'm bouncing back, like, 10 for 13. Right. So, cool, that's why that game, that 10 for 13, that, that means a lot to me because it helped me bounce back from missing the game. Right, right. I think you had what, you ended up with, like, 34 points or something like that, so you had... <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I redeemed myself. So I was like, all right, I'm cool. I I, I can keep it now. I'm good. I'm good. I redeemed myself. So I still watch that game. Um I still watch the game where I tore my Achilles. Um in Memphis. Yeah, just because it's you know, that was a devastating time. That was that was one of the lowest points ever. But just just because just to see how things was going before that. Um, you know, I feel like when I really went to Memphis after being traded, that's when I was really coming into my own of, of being able to be looked to as a leader, being that guy, because, you know, I was the only one with two championships on that Memphis team. Um, mm-hmm. You know, Tony won, um, and the rest of the guys had never been. So I was looked to as, you know, one of those top tier guys. Right. So I just felt like, you know, that, that season, I was just really coming into my own. I was showing people that I could really play. I could be one of these point guards, the top point guards. I could do it all. And then, Boom, that, that happened. So it's just, that's just one of the games I watched because of that. Now, speaking of Memphis, right? So, so you signed with the Grizzlies. Mm-hmm. Did they love you or did they hate you from what you did with the Memphis Tigers? Huh? Did they love you or did they hate you? Because even when I was there, it was it's a basketball town, a city. The people are great. The, the food is great. Like, they just love basketball. They love you. You know what I'm saying? You get to mingle with the, uh, you know, with the fans and just the city life, whatever. Like they, they love, respect hard workers in itself. So from you, the damage you did for them in college, for the university, now you come there as a Grizzly. How was that? How was that love uh, given to you? I didn't receive no love. When I got <laughs> traded there, when I got I'm traded sure. there, when I got traded there, I'm thinking like, when they call my name, I'm going to get the biggest booze ever. <laughs> So when we come to the game, like I'm sitting there, I'm sweating, like coaches are talking. I'm sitting there, I'm all out sweating, like, man, I do not want to play this game. This is my first game, first Portland. I'm talking to Mike, Mike, like, Mike, like, Mario, you all right? I'm like, yeah, man, I'm good, I'm good. But I'm posed, I'm drenched. <laughs> I'm like, you feel all right? I said, man, I'm good. It's just my first game. I'm nervous. He's like, all right, man, don't be nervous, man. You didn't play th- thousands of basketball games. You go out there and have fun. Oh. Like, all right, man, whatever. You just don't understand. So we get out there. Warming up. I see fans this, I see some fans do this, and I'm like, man, what is going on? Like, I don't know what to think. So boom, mm. game start, come off the bench. I hit my first shot. It's mm. one of them. You know the dry claps? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like like I guess so. Er, er. Yes, so he okay. So boom, I think that game I finished with like seven or nine. Uh, I think we ended up winning that game. Then we play somebody else. I don't I forget who. And then that's when the OKC game comes. And me being being at Miami, I know a little bit about the OKC Memphis beef, but I don't really know about it. Like I just uh-huh. y'all play on the TV the playoff series. I know it's intense, but being there and hearing how much they hate each other, right. I was like, okay, this is my game to win the fans over. Mm, mm, so that's the game right. I had nine. That's the game I'm, I'm in this month. That's what I'm right, saying. Right. Y'all going to love me or hate me, but I'm here. Like, right. You know, <laughs> everything on the court, what y'all going to say? Right. We beat OKC, then fans love me. Like, I'm a fan favorite. I can go out. I'm getting called for appearances. Like, I'm just like, oh, okay. Right. Like, so I know what I had to do to, to win the fans over. It was just, make them forget about the Kansas Memphis thing and really right. thing. so I mean after that everything was cool it's, it's it's all love like I still get fans to this day that they like oh we hated you when we played at Kansas but we love you we miss you you were so grit and grind right. so it's just about leaving your mark wherever you go you know try to win the fans over try to win the people over and just show that you know no matter you got your favorite team your favorite player but it's all about basketball you know when that player comes there it's, it's basketball all right yeah, you just spoke on it earlier about, you know, saying uh, the injury of, of tearing your Achilles, you know what I'm saying, one of your lowest points. Um, but you also had Kobe Bryant, you mm-hmm. know what I'm saying, experience, and, and uh, he reached out to you. 
how did that conversation go? Did you already have Kobe like pro number program? Then he found your number, but he reached out to you to give you some support. How was that? How did that conversation go? Because <laughs> he don't talk to nobody at the end nobody. of the day. And like, for him to reach that. out. My only conversation with Kobe was oh, I'm about to lock you up. He told me that when we played them. And then uh, the game I hit 10 threes, we played them, I want to say like a week or two later. He was like, oh, now I got to go out here and hit 11 because you want to hit 10. <laughs> I'm looking like, this is Kobe talking to me. Like, right. I don't know what to say. Like anybody else, I'm like, man, get out of my face. This is me. <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, like, do what you got to do. Like, I, I'm not competing with you. You're not on my level. This ain't got nothing to do with me. You, you go over there with D-Wayne, so. Right. <laughs> in between me. But, like, after that, like, the conversation started. He just texted me. He said, I think he said, he said, the worst, the worst is behind you and the best is coming. Just saying, like, pretty much, like, you done went through the worst part of the Achilles tear, like, you tore it. Like, now it's your time to focus on getting better and keeping your spirits high. But like when he said that, I, I was like, who's this? Like I take back, who's this? He said, Bean. Mm. Bean. You know nobody named Bean? Who's Bean? Right. <laughs> so then I'm I'm looking, it's a it's a Cali number. I'm like, I know this ain't Kobe Bryant. Texas, my phone. Like, right. Immediately I hit D Wade, like, hey man. You need Kobe? He's like, yeah, I told Kobe to reach out to you just to uh no, he, he said, Kobe reached out to me, asked me for your number, so he wanted to holler at you. Right. Wow. I was like, Bean, who? Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> it takes back, RPB. you know who Bean is. Mm. Say no more. Say no more. <laughs> Appreciate it. Like, da 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 da. We started texting, like, what else do I have to do? Like, what's, what's going to be? He's like, just. Just know that your your worst days aren't your worst days and your best days ain't going to be your best days. And like just going through that process of trying to get back, like, I ain't going to lie, I would wish that on my worst enemy. Like that, going through that for me was like truly tough and like depressing just because like for me, my stitches wasn't staying in my body. So I had three different surgeries on my Achilles to, to wow. repair. So in my wow. mind, keep going through these surgeries i'm like man i'm never gonna be able to play basketball again at the same time this is my right foot i can't drive i can't do nothing like i'm depending on somebody i'm like this ain't life like, i can't live like this like i can't do it right so just just being able to to snap out of that from the texas from kobe from from d way from ud like from the amount of people that reached out to me it was like like a lot of people really care for me and really have my back and really respect me from what I did. Like I heard from people that I haven't talked to in the NBA for years, like people I didn't even know have, have my number. And it was just like, okay, cool. Like, okay, like I'm really respected. Like people really care. So it's like, that gave me more of a motivation to get back. And then my kids see, see my kids every day. They was like, dad, let's go play. And I'm like, I can't, I can't do that. Like feeling sorry for myself. So it was like, you gotta get out of that. Like, no matter what, like basketball, basketball is basketball, but basketball ain't gonna be there forever. Right. And that's, that's just coming out of that and bring myself out of that and giving it one more try. That was, that was big for me. That was big for me. I would say that. So you recovered, was that 2019? And then, you know, able to, I mean, you come back, I say, I guess basketball wise, but leading up to that, you, I mean, you play, you work out, and then you get an opportunity to play in the Italian league. Mm -hmm. Where you end up winning what? Is that what it, a championship? Exactly. Another championship. You come right back. It was a major part of that as well. Like uh, just coming back, I know the road to recovery. Like you said, you had a lot of people reaching out for you, but you had to feel good uh, to come back. I mean, I know it ain't the league, but it's another opportunity to play basketball. And then yeah, that's an opportunity to play basketball. For me, um, winning that championship, I kind of had tears in my eyes just because just everything I've been through, like, then when I signed with Memphis, how everything that went through, mm -hmm. it, it was just a rough comeback for me. And then being able to win that championship and, you know, still seeing some light in basketball and being able to have fun with it again, that that helped a lot too. And then uh, playing that Italian league, that was a lot of fun. You know, even though I was only there for two months, um, it was still a lot of fun. Um, that's one of the championships I do say that, uh, that I don't think I earned. I was just a part of it. Just because really? – 
it was a good team. Like it was a real good team. Not saying that my experience or my my input didn't help the team, but I'm just saying like they was already a good team in Champions League. I'm not gonna sit there and be like, oh, I was the reason they won. Da, 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 da. Right. I mean, I think I think that's when my vet status, like my mind really became like a vet. Like just talk to the young guys, just tell them like different things you see and let them go out there and do what they do. Cause they they've already been there. So it was that was one of the moments where it was like. This is what they was telling me in the NBA. Like, this is what you need to be start becoming more of a vet leader instead of thinking that you could still play. And I'm like, mm, you know, man, I just sat out for two years. I'm coming back from a fresh acute. I still got game. Like, right, right. I'm still ready to go to show I can still hoop because I was just coming into me, but it was kind of like, we don't want that. And I right. think that's where I think that's where the situation in Memphis kind of went, it kind of clashed and went wrong. And that's when I say that's when that's why I'm in the situation I am in now. Wow. So right now you're you over in Greece. How's that going? Uh, it's cool. I mean, the, the COVID, the COVID is different. Playing with no fans, um, playing with a young team. Uh, we okay. Seven, seven and 15. Uh, eight spot. Got a chance to make the playoffs. But we, yep. not, we had deal, deal with some different things during the season, different injuries and stuff. So um, we never had a whole team to the end. Right. I know you you brought up the COVID. You you said y'all been on lockdown over there. Like, what, what is that like? I mean, we know how it is over here. How is it over there in Greece? Being it, it, is it locked down over there, or are people still moving around? It's, they move around because they know how to move around. Like for us, mm. we don't like we don't know. Like I go to practice and I come home and I be in the house all day because I know there's nothing else to do. Like I know. I can't go anywhere. Everybody else be having a house party and stuff like that. And it's like, I don't know nobody. Like, so I just, I ain't had a chance to meet nobody. So I just sit down. Right. All so what you, uh, PlayStation 5, what you YouTube, you on the computer, what you playing? What you playing over there? I got the, you know, I'm on the Call of Duty. I'm on the, the <laughs> I'm on the Madden. And then I just be watching shows, just watching old things, watching old basketball games. I'm just find my different ways to be entertained. Are you able to keep up with the NBA game over there? Yeah, I definitely do. I still got the so, uh, I got the fire sticks. I'll be watching games. So one, who you think the MVP gonna be at the end of the season? What you think about this Brooklyn Nets team? And any players you got your eye on? Um, my favorite player to watch right now, I would say, is Kyrie, Jason Tatum. And I like I like De'Aaron Fox. I like I like De'Aaron Fox. People sleep on D Fox, but I, I'm a big fan of D Fox. I like his game. And then that Brooklyn team, it's gonna be. Tough. I think they missing one piece, like one really one. I think they need somebody like a like a Jared Allen or to play DeAndre. Like they gonna need that that lockdown center that can protect the rim when it comes to playoff time. I just think that. So I think that's the only thing right now. But for the regular season. You know how it goes in regular season. You win, you lose, you get ready for the playoffs. So who you got in the finals? Mm. I'm going to say this. I'm going to do Eastern, <laughs> Conference, Eastern Conference finals. I got, I got Miami and Brooklyn. Okay. Western Conference finals, I got – it's either going to be Utah and Clippers or Utah and Lakers. Depending on how Brian will come back. That's what I want to see, how Brian and AD come back first. Yeah. I mean, speaking of LeBron, you know, he's been out with his injury and everything. Now, what, year 18? What What do you think about that? And for him to still be playing at, at the highest level, like, I know they're probably tired of hearing me talk about, you know, his preparation for the game, but well, how did you see him. his preparation for the game while you, while you played with him and just knowing him? This much rest is bad for the opponent. <laughs> Right, right. They think he just rested and ain't doing nothing, though. Man, that man doing treatment 19 times a day in the pool nope. running. Like, he's just he's just saving his body. That's all he's doing is resting his body. And, and, he, he, and he watching games, zoning in on plays, actions, and more players. Like, like he already he got one chilling, of the greatest. Like, I would say that Brown has one of the greatest basketball minds I've ever been around. Like, it's coming to, like, seeing things, dissecting plays, knowing what teams is about to run. Like, I've never <laughs> Nobody that's like that. And all you're doing is getting more time. And you can't do that with that. 
Like, you got to keep going, wear him down, wear him down, wear him down. Then try to let him figure out how to get the get rest. But this is this is gonna be scary. That's why I said I'm interested to see how they come back because they come right. back. It's gonna be it's gonna be a wrap. It's gonna be too much. All right. All right. So outside of basketball, do you still uh are you still doing your charity work? I see you, yeah. do you still have your AU team. And we was talking earlier about your little wine collection. Tell us a little bit about that, what you got going on outside of basketball. Um, outside of basketball, I still got the Mario V. Chalmers Foundation. Um, you know, we've been shut down right now just because of COVID, but we usually hold a, a golf tournament every year in Kansas. Um, you know, that's one of my biggest events. You know, the golf, the golf goes crazy in Kansas, so I gotta get, I gotta get y'all to come out there one time just to be. A let part me of know. It. I've been working. Hey, listen, I've been working on my game the past three years, so I'm ready. Just let me know. Everybody golfing now, so I'm trying. I'm trying to make it like try to make it do a little special where I have a competition. So we definitely got some things that'll work. Um, we still we're still doing camps. Um, definitely about to head to Alaska uh, in June to do a basketball camp up there in my hometown. So. That's gonna be fun. I've never you know. been to Alaska. I just know you gotta dress warm. Just let me know. Not in the summertime. Not in the summertime. Not so oh, okay. And then it don't get dark. So it's 24 hour sunlight. What? So just be, just be it be don't get dark. Come on. Re, re, don't get dark. Wow. Wow. How how is that? Like, how is that? How do people function and it doesn't get dark? I mean, because normally it sets the tone for you getting your rest. But that's just daylight. <laughs> you gotta take a nap. That's all. That's, that's what we call naps. We go take a nap. Take a nap. Go to school to come back. Take a nap. Because four hours of sunlight, you can't do nothing. Wow. You can't make it dark unless you got blackout shades. So it's mm. always fun. always playing basketball. Everybody in the park. Like it used to be fun. It used to be a lot of fun back then. All right. What else you got going on? You said daddy did then your AU team. And yeah, the you know, wine collection. The wine collection is something we just we just released. Uh, we got a Chalmers wine, uh, red and white. Um, I'm a bigger fan of the white just because I think I think all red wine is bitter. I'm still trying to get the, the taste of it, but from from the reviews and the reports, everybody loves the red wine. So if you anybody want to go check it out, it's at sugarhill.com. Um, you can order it on there. Um, and uh, yeah, support your boy. Tell me what y'all think. For sure. So, so how did you get into the wine? Like, I mean, the grapes and I mean, the grow, the whole process. How did that, you know, how did that come about? Um, it started with my dad. My dad was a big wine drinker. So um, it was just something like we wanted to do something as a family that we could put our family name on. You know, of course, I was doing the basketball stuff. So I just wanted something where we could all go in together as a family. Somebody be, I mean, we all get make, make make money off of it. Everybody can eat off of it. So um, we started that process. My mom and dad, they was really behind it. I just came in. I was kind of the wine taster, being able to taste different wines. And um, they matched all the grapes. And once they picked out their favorite, um, I tasted both of theirs. And I was like, this is perfect. And, um, you know, they produced the white and the red. And we was finally hitting the shelves. So it was finally coming out. So uh, people don't understand like the importance of, say that again. It's been a long process, but it's finally here. So, I mean, so can you tell us a little bit about the whole grape picking process to how it changes a little bit, you know, about that or? Um, just change with the season. Um, you know, from what I know, uh, the sweeter the grapes is, the the sweeter the wine's gonna be. Um, I'm still trying to learn how they figure out the, the bitterness of the grapes and stuff like that, but um from that just picking out the grapes and mushing them all together figuring out what tastes <laughs> what tastes great together and what doesn't so it's a lot of trial and error and then once you finally get the right taste that you've been trying to get to um it's, it's an easy process after that so basically you and your family y'all y'all choose what taste y'all want to put out there and then it's a whole you know process of just bottling it up and then shipping it out huh yep get it all through the process and everything and shipping it out so like I said, it's been, it's been a long process, but it's finally here and it's finally, it's finally getting some life to it. So it, it's fun to see something come to life. Wow. Well, congrats on that. Make sure I, I get a bottle or two or three or four or something like that. I got some time on my hand. I can sip, sip for real, for real. <laughs> definitely don't say so. Appreciate it. Well, at the end of the show, I have a segment called Free Game. Mm -hmm. What free game can you give the people that's out here? It could. It could be basketball. It could be anything you want, but it's free game for the people that's going to listen or, or see this. Um, my free game, something that always helped me um, growing up was never let anybody tell you that you can't do anything. 
Um, you know, for me growing up, I had a lot of people tell me that I would never make it to the NBA. I would never make it out of Alaska. I wouldn't even make it to play college basketball. So for me, I used all that hate and all that negativity into grind. You know, made myself work even harder. And every time I thought about quitting, I replayed what people said to me in my mind. And that just made me go harder. So never let anybody tell you that you can't do something that you really want to do, that you know how to do. And y'all have a free game for Mario Chalmers, two-time NBA champion, NCAA champion, FIBA world champion, two-time high school champion from Anchorage, Alaska. Man, we appreciate your time, man. I know you're over there in Greece right now. Y'all are here, so you're probably going to chill the rest of the day, but I appreciate you taking the time out to join me on the polls, cast, man. Thank you. Appreciate you having me, family. All right. All right, brother. Love, Love man. Love.